Hello, everybody. Um, this is the second of our series of three main based webinars to replace our in person, our usual in person preseason meeting, which, of course, because of COVID, we're doing online this year. And today we're very fortunate to have Dr. Jaime Pinheiro, who is the Associate Extension Professor of Treefort Entomology at the University of Massachusetts. His research focuses on applied aspects of insect plant interactions to develop more sustainable pest management tools and strategies for fruit orchards. He works on developing behaviorally based pest management tools um, with insect, in insect sensory ecology and behavior, such as attract and kill systems, including odor baited trap trees for plum coquilio, mass trapping for Japanese beetles, and bait stations for fruit flies. In a larger sense, his research is aimed at a better understanding of pest and natural enemy ecology. And today, Dr. Pinheiro is talking about a research update on early season insect pest. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this um, seminar. Today, I will be focusing on three insect uh, species, which is the tarnished plant bug, European apple sawfly, and plum curculio. And throughout the presentation, I will be using acronyms, which is TPV, ESE, AES and PC for these three insects. So I will discuss more specifically biology. Uh, it's about, going to be about 15 minutes. Monitoring, including research that we're doing in this area, and management. So I hope I will cover uh, everything uh, in this uh, time period. So let's go with biology. This table shows a summary of the overwintering stage for each of these three insect species. In the case of tarnished plant bog and plum curculio, well, they spend the winter as adults and in forested areas on their surface leaf litter. In the case of European apple sawfly, this insect spends the winter as a mature larva. So all these three species uh, attack developing fruit. So tarnished plant bog and feeds on developing um, buds, as you, as you know, as they feed, nymphs and adults inject a toxic saliva. And what you have is the cells dying in that area. And then when the fruit continues to grow, it's going to be having a dimple or a um, cut facing because of this uh, piercing uh, um, injury. So in some days you can see that the bots uh, they will uh, produce some clear, sometimes amber um, ooze. You can identify the injury also based on these uh, uh, symptoms. And tarnish plant bog starts feeding very early in the season. It can happen at the silver stage um, with develop, bud development, but most of the feeding takes place from green tip through petal pole. So keep in mind that despite control efforts, a small amount of injury may not be uh, possible to prevent. So also most damage seems to be shallow, not very detectable by some customers. So usually it's not noticed uh, by uh, uh, customers or uh, normal grading procedures. So feeding before the pink stage is going to make the pool, the, the, the both to fall off, but feeding after the pink stage is going to result in this fruit that has this um, in dimples. Regarding European apple sawfly biology, overwintering takes place as a mature larvae in the soil. And it mean, that means that the insect is going to spend 11 months in one year in the soil. So it's only the adult that you will be able to, um, to see and to control if there is a need. So the adults emerge during pink, um, it's a highly synchronized pest. European apple sawfly only attacks apples, and the eggs are laid usually in the calyx end of the developing fruit. So the activity, the adults become active during the day, and the situation is that when the trees are in bloom, of course, you are not going to be able to, uh, to prevent them, uh, or uh, you cannot apply insecticides. After the larvae hatch, they feed on the epidermis, and that produces some superficial damage. 
all their larvae can bore into the fruit and as they feed inside the, the, the tissue, including the seeds, that will make the, the fruit to, to abort. So irrepenable soft fly damage occurs more frequently when bloom time is extended and when the petal fall sprays are delayed for some reason. So let's discuss monitoring. So for tarnish plant bug and aeropenapol soft fly, uh, you can monitor using uh, white sticky cards. And for these two insect species, no lures have been developed. So I was told today actually that there is a researcher who identified the pheromone of the tarnish plant bug. So this person is going to publish in a journal and then eventually companies will probably produce the pheromone of the tarnish plant bug, but it's not available at, uh, for this year or maybe the, ne the next year. So for plum curculio, when it comes to traps, well, the most effective traps is the black pyramid trap. Uh, many growers don't like to use it because uh, it takes uh, time and it's um, not very stable. The, the new ones are, um, the material doesn't make them very stable. But we also have a different tool for monitoring, which is the actual tree. It's called the trap tree approach, which um, involves baiting the branches of a single tree, perimeter row tree, with a powerful lure. And this lure, and uh, I will explain in a moment, is an um, grandisoic acid, the plum curcurio pheromone, and in combination with um, benzaldehyde, which is a fruit volatile. So this approach was developed by Ron Procopy, and I will discuss that in more detail in the next slides. But just in a few words, this trap tree approach allows you to tell or to determine that if there is no fresh injury on a trap tree, then there is no need to spray insecticides. Timing of um, setting up the traps for tarnish plant bug, and uh, it will be at or before the silver and tip stage. You can check traps every week. For European apple supply, I would say early pink stage or a few days before. But for plum curculio, if you want to use the trap tree approach, the best time to deploy it, to deploy the lures, is during early bloom. Trap positioning, well, for uh, Tarnish plant bog is two feet above, above ground. For European apple supply, it will be a, a head height, usually on the south side of the tree, that's the recommendation. And for the plum curculio, the trap tree, it will be a single perimeter row tree in, in one block. Well, while we're waiting, I got a question. What are the prospects for this tarnish plant bug pheromone? Is that something, is that 10 years away or two years away? Um, I, could, I could ask um, one of the companies, but it's likely that may happen in a couple of, I don't think it's going to be 10 or five. I think it's going to be perhaps two, <laughs> that's my guess. And do you know how strong it is? How effective it is at pulling them in? Well, because it's a pheromone, I would suspect it's, um, of course, very specific. And it may be a very good tool for monitoring. Um, and before that, or in combination to that, I have some information about uh, trapping uh, research results in, a, in the next slides. So I, I expect to be effective. Uh, that's my expectation. I don't know how expensive. All right. And this. Um... <laughs> I never put my tarnished plant bug traps out at silver tip. It's just too early and silver tips kind of hard to identify. I do it at green tip. I don't think I miss many because the first week or so I don't get any anyway. So how religious are you about silver tip for tarnished plant bug traps? And I understand. And basically um, that's what you can find in the New England and um, tree fruit management guide. Right. Personally, because of research, we have been setting them up uh, at the uh, silver tip stage just because I want to catch the early ones. Uh, right. That's the case. Uh, so basically, let's discuss uh, action thresholds. Do you need to spray or not against these insects? So according to the New England Tree Fruit Management Guide, the current threshold is a cumulative number of three to four tarnish plant box per trap by type, type cluster. or five and insects by the late and uh, pink stage. However, as I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I was reading older March messages from Ron Procopy and other UMass uh, uh, faculty and other collaborators such as Glenn and others. So I came up with some information which was presented by Ron Procopy in 1999. So this is the information. 
he said in this uh, March message when he wrote that he was working on refining thresholds based on three years of research, 1996 to 1998. So I would like to know, this is not a poll, but I came up with these numbers. This is coming from the March message. So when, what you see is for wholesale, three cumulative uh, tarnish plant box per traps that coincide with the New England guide or five silver tip to pink. But when you are now working more or selling more uh, your apple fruit for retail, the threshold that Ron Procopy develops actually is a little, you can, you can tolerate more and um, a few more uh, tarnish plant box in traps. Five silver tip to tight cluster or eight silver tip to pink. I guess I would just like to ask uh, Glenn, Glenn, have you seen anyone using this um, threshold for retail? I, there aren't very many main growers trapping at all. Um, well, anyway, this is the information again, I just, I was able to find. Um, subsequently, I found in healthy fruit articles, reference to this uh, threshold for retail. Well, when it comes to European apple soft fly, that's, I think, a little tricky because you can read that the need for pesticide application is based on cumulative captures from pink petal fall. Then, based on the guide, the action threshold is average cumulative per trap of four to five by petal fall if there was no pre bloom insecticides, or six to nine cumulative number by petal fall if you spray insecticide before bloom. But number one, the petal fall anyway is going to take care uh, of uh, long curculio and other pests. So you are not going to avoid the petal fall spray. So that's pretty much the way to control European apple soft fly. And number two, most growers in Massachusetts do not spray insecticides before bloom. I personally don't know any grower in Massachusetts who sprays against other pests before bloom. So I would say for European apple soft fly, the petal fall spray should be the way to control this, um, this insect, uh, regardless of the thresholds, unless, unless you have high captures before bloom, but that's just a little difficult to tell because uh, I haven't read much about this situation happening. But, in 2002, I was reading in this Healthy Fruit article, you can say it's late in this, um, it's not pink, it's not bloom, it's late petal fall fruit set. And there was this uh, note um, where European apple soft fly was found in very high numbers. You can see over 100 soft flies in several trap catches greater than 30. But it's late. So of course, doesn't really apply to control and because you spray it, spray a petal fall. But has anyone seen high captures of European apple soft fly at any time between pink and petal fall? Has anyone seen that? Personally, I have not seen anything like that or read anything like this in the last, well, only because I went to healthy fruit. But we don't see high captures of European apple soft fly in, in sticky cards. Well, hi, I mean, this is Glenn. I've seen it. You have seen high captures? Uh, yeah. Okay. Is that leading to a recommendation of spraying before bloom? Or is the petal fall spray who is taking care of those situations? Well, in the block that I'm thinking of where I saw it, um, I, can't, I can't actually remember if there was a pre-bloom insecticide or not in that block, but um, I've seen traps just covered with soft flies. It seems like a warm... When you get a warm, dry spring, that, that increases their trap catch. Well, thank you. And I'm including this slide because in my experience, which is not much with European apple soft fly with management, I have not seen that. And you can see in this uh, slide that surrounds howling clay, it could be a good way of protecting um, the early developing fruit, I guess, before the petal fall, um, because it's not toxic to bees and it should be a repellent. So this is coming from that um, slide. And I think may not be a bad idea to, uh, if there is a need, maybe to try with the cowling clay. But it's just a, an idea. 
So I was discussing uh, the economic thresholds for Spanish plant bog and also for uh, European apple so fly. So now with Plum Curculio, based on five years of research, um, that's when I was back at UMass, then there is a powerful lure that was developed, is commercially available, can be used for monitoring, can be used for control. Using traps baited with pheromone, the Plum Curculio pheromone and Belsaldehyde, what you can see in this slide now is that the squares with the Years. That shows, based on my research as a grad student, six years of captures. When are you able to um, predict? Are you able to predict the onset of the plum curculio immigration based on degree day? The answer is yes. So I was able on this uh, degree day model, and, but I just didn't do enough extension work until now. So you can expect, based on these six, of, six years of data, that. At 220 degree days, base 43, uh, accumulating from, I would say, 1st of March, and that's when you can expect plum curculios to show up. So it's not really related to a specific stage of development. In 2004, the first plum curculios were found in a silver tip. In 2001, it was an early pink. But in, 2000, in the year 2000, 2002, and 2003, it was a tight cluster. So there is some variability when it comes to phenology, but there is more precision when you are um, calculating degree days. So after I came back to UMass in 2018, then we have more information, of course. You can see in yellow now the squares telling, telling us or telling you that in 2018 and 19, it was a tight cluster when we found the first plum curculius. And in 2020, it was an early pink. So it feel there is some variability there but it's pointing more to tight cluster and, and pink. And you can also see the specific degree days at which we caught the first plum curculios using traps. And you can see the date, May 2nd, April 24th, and May 4th. Now, when we combine this information into the nine year average, then I will expect plum curculios to show up in, at least in Belcher Town using traps at 216 degree days base in 43. So let's now uh, back to the thresholds. Um, action thresholds were developed for Plum Curculio by Ron Procopi in 2003 and 2004. This, this is an approach that is effective. And it needs a lot more extension work to be able to tell growers that it can be done, it's not expensive, and it, it takes time. I'm sorry, it doesn't take time. It's very easy to do. So each trap tree, when you bake the tree with Belsaldehyde and pheromone, it's going to congregate plum curculios to that tree. And that's proven, that has been done for many years. And one trap tree can provide information for one to three acre blocks. So the approach is, in a, just in a few uh, words, in early bloom, you bait the trap tree, then you select 25 um, developing fruits, you plug them, and then twice a week after the petal fall spray, Twice a week, you can go to that tree, just one tree, and just check these 25 fruits, the same ones every time. If there is a fresh injury, there is a need to spray. If there is an injury, you can mark with a Sharpie. So you, when you come back the next time, you don't count the same, the same fruit. So this sim simple approach really shows um, that it's effective. You can, whenever you find one injury, fresh injury in 25 fruits, you spray the perimeter only the perimeter. And all this process is explained in a fact sheet that is, uh, you can find in UMass extension. So now there is evidence that benzaldehyde may be attractive to tarnish plant bog. And again, when I was doing my work in, in Belcher Town in the field, I was reporting to Ron what I was finding with Plum Curculio. He was reporting that information to healthy fruits or in healthy fruits. But I also reported to him patches of tarnished plant bog in my traps. And the trap that I was reporting is not the pyramid trap. It was the, this clear lexicon panel that has a benzaldehyde and pheromone. So the pheromone was not responsible for attraction. It was benzaldehyde. Then he has this note in uh, this healthy fruit that in Conway, uh, he had this, the same traps and he was catching 25 
starting to plant bug per trap in just a few days. And that is as a result of the benzaldehyde, or very likely. So then there is another note made that the plexiglass panels in Belcher Town, they were catching 15 times more starting to plant bog than the white sticky cards that are usually used for uh, monitoring. So that's more evidence that the saldehyde was, it seems to be attractive to, to tarnish plant bog. So benzaldehyde is an aromatic compound. Uh, there is a specific characteristic that makes different uh, plant volatiles to, to belong to the same category. So there are different types of aromatic compounds. So now, starting last year, and in 2018, I also did some work, we are evaluating different aromatic compounds to determine which ones are attractive, not only to tarnish plant bog, but also to European apple sawfly and plum curculio. And the idea would be to see if benzaldehyde maybe can be replaced by a different compound if we can find that this other compound is more attractive. Okay, long story short, I have a grad student at UMass. Her name is Pravina Rekmi. She's focusing on early season pests. She's evaluating plant volatiles for multiple pests. She's also involved in this project, which I will not be discussing today about grafting trees, grafting perimeter row trees with multiple cultivars, which are attractive to pests. That is working well, but I am not going to cover that today. So Pravina joined my lab in 2020. She's using white sticky cards and clear sticky cards just for research. The clear sticky cards is because I want to catch the insects with, without the influence of visual cues. So it's just the odor that I want to test. So what I want to show you now is that benzaldehyde is the one that we have been testing or we know is attractive to plum purpulio in combination with the pheromone. So it's, in, it's included in the evaluation. You can see benzyl alcohol in this figure. You can see benzonitril. Then we have compound A. Compound A is a different um, plant volatile. And this graph shows you the mean number of tarnished plant bug captured per trap. The control is a sticky card with no lure. And then what you can see is that the performance of the plant volatile A seems to be pretty good, as good as benzaldehyde. So based on variability, we have no difference among treatments, but there is some trends that plant A, volatile A, and benzaldehyde seem to be doing a good job, but we have to do more work, of course. So this other um, chart that sends the results of um, one, one experiment that Pravina conducted, where she had one lure, one dispenser of the volatile A, then she has four dispensers of the same volatile. And then she has a different dispenser or different trap with four different plant volatiles combined. What you can see is that when you increase the dose of the compound uh, A, you increase the response. And now it's really showing to be attractive to tarnish plant bog. Well, here is one more uh, study where she was just comparing pl and the plant volatile A versus control is attractive. In a different experiment, she found, you can see the numbers, they're higher. And there is no significant difference because there was some variability in results, but it still shows maybe 70% increase in captures. So plant volatile A is promising. And I'm talking on those graphs were showing a European apple sawfly. So we're finding as a validation kind of confirmation that other sawfly species, which are the native species that are sm smaller, that also come into the traps. You can see the number of sawflies, which is not the European apple sawfly, responding to the volatile A versus control, which is on beta. So this compound seems to be promising and Ravina will be working more on this uh, this year. So how prevalent were the insect pests in New England in 2020? So what I would like to show you is some results um, based on the harvest survey in 2020 is uh, 11 blocks, seven in Massachusetts, three in New Hampshire, one in Maine. And all this injury or data that we present today concerns 
the grower standard. But we have no experiments there. There is nothing that is different. It's basically what the growers are doing to control uh, multiple pests. So this graph is going to show you all these insects that we recorded. And it, this is based on incidents. In how many orchards of these 11, we found any injury by prone curculio? Well, all of them. How many, in how many orchards we, we found injury by tarnish plant bog or a different early season hemiptera, but we're blaming the tarnish plant bog. It's hard to tell uh, which insect caused the injury early in the season when you are picking the fruit at harvest. But let's say it's a tarnish plant bog. Well, everyone, every orchard had uh, some injury by tarnish plant bog. Sting box. Sting box is also a little tricky because I cannot tell you if that was the brown marmorated sting bog or that was a native species. But we dissected the fruit and we found that in eight orchards there was injury by sting box. European apple saw fly in six orchards out of 11, but injury was extremely low, very, very low, and so on. So have rollers and oriental fruit mold and other species. Apple maggot, that's a, also a part of this, the, the data. So now, so we inspected more than 10,000 fruits at harvest. And I will show you now the results for the early season pests with a focus on plum curculio and harness plant bog according to orchard. So I'm not showing which orchards, it's just I'm using a coding system, but CSO1 and CSO2, those are two blocks in Belchertown, the UMass Cold Spring Orchard. What you can see now is that sting bug injury, um, it was low. It was no more than 1% in uh, these blocks. Most of them had zero. There was just, some of them had 0 0.2, 0 0.3 injury by sting bugs, but that's not the point for this uh, uh, presentation. So when it comes to plum curculio, Everyone can tell the level and the type of injury that you can see at harvest. So those are the blue dots. One block in, in Belchertown, even though we sprayed and it was management in, in, in the normal way, traditional way, there was 4% injury for the entire block. But the other, a different block, it was 1% uh, whole block injury. And then you can see some variability. In some, in some blocks, it was less than 2%, but there was one orchard, H, in which long curculio injury, it was more than 8%. So something needs to be done there. And I think what happened was maybe late spray at petal fall. Maybe there was some delay in the spray that led to more than 8% injury. But when it comes to tarnish plant bog, you can see the, the results for cold spring orchard are very similar. It's less than 2% for the whole um, block, two different blocks. In some orchards, it went as high as 5%. But I want to tell you something here that the injury that we recorded is even the small dimple on the fruit we consider to be injury. But that fruit can be sold. So basically the 5%, it doesn't mean you're, you're losing the 5% the, the of the fruit that has injury. Some proportion of those fruits, the injury is very light and I think can be sold. It's no fruit that you will not be able to sell. So that's what I can tell you um, in these uh, 11 orchards for the injury by plum curculio and tarnish plant bog. So then my, que my question is, if fruit injury by tarnish plant bog is 0.5% to 1%, let's say that we're just discussing or uh, uh, considering the fruit that you cannot sell, the fruit that really has a more injury and people will reject the fruit. I'm talking about retail. Is it cost effective to spray against tarnish plant bog? So, I went back to the March message and I have been trying to get a good idea of populations uh, of tarnish plant bog over time. So this table shows you in blue and white are the March message years, which means that when Ron Procopi published, for example, 1997 March message, he's presenting results of the previous year, 1996. You can see that in, in most years, the statement were pretty much, it was low populations, below average um, for, for trapping and also for injury. And in all these years, it's eight years, only in two years, 
there was a report of high injury uh, and high trapping uh, uh, results for that for the previous season. So what does it mean? Again, the there was no numbers. It was not like uh, the average is this and it's going to be less or below or above this number. So basically, the comment was more about below average. So the one percent in 1998 March message, the less than one percent. Them understanding that refers to the injury, which I believe then it will be average of one percent. That's that's my interpretation. So then, what you see in 2003 is that the description was the statement was it was well above levels of service plant fog seen in many years, like eight different years. So I don't know if you have seen anything like 2002 and three in New England, but I have not seen that in, in the last three years. So let's continue with the, some notes. So you can see now that for every year, there was some uh, information about, okay, it was similar in New England, it was similar in Quebec, but what you can also see now in these uh, boxes is that they are now reporting or uh, speculating that maybe the low populations is because of the parasitic wasp that was introduced in, in New Jersey and multiple times. So I would like to discuss that in the next slides. So this is a parasitic wasp which attacks the nymphs of the uh, Tarnis plant bog. Well, this wasp has been released in North America multiple times. And it became established in Northwestern New Jersey in the alfalfa fields in 1994. So according to the reports by 1988, 89, it had spread to Southern New York. So then it's reported that by 1993, it was in the Hudson Valley and then it reached the Canadian border by 1996. Well, according to reports, you can see the paper 1990 by uh, Dr. Day, the average total parasitism, parasitism of nymphs by this wasp in 1987-1998, it was 36% in the first generation and 29% in the second generation. And this is about three times, according to the report, the normal rate of parasitism by native species. So this suggests that this wasp seems at that moment seems to be working. I don't know if this wasp is continues to attack a tarnished plant bog in orchards. Um, but just an interesting situation here that it could be that the low population that you have seen maybe is in part, I don't mean it's just the parasitoids, it's a combination of factors, but it could be that this wasp is doing a good job. I mean, it could be. But then when it comes to spraying or not, well, we need to protect the wasp. I just have not been able to do any surveys. I don't know if anyone knows in the last five years, if there is any information about the parasitism by this wasp in, 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 or, in orchards. I'm not, I'm not aware of those numbers. There was a report by Alan Eaton, but that's like a maybe 20 years old, um, uh, stating that there was parasitism um, documented. So now when we're talking about management, so I would, what I would like to do is spend uh, a few minutes talking about plum curculio, because what I discussed before the trap tree approach for monitoring, I was saying is, a, is an effective way of uh, determining if you need to spray the perimeter after the petal for spray. Well, in 2008, you can see this paper published where that was the first time that in the two preceding years, there was research done to determine if you can bait no one tree for monitoring. Can you bait multiple trees along the perimeter of the block with benzaldehyde and pheromone? And after the petal hole spray, you only spray those trees. So there was research done. We compared the trap tree plots versus perimeter row plots. So the spray was just to these uh, locations after the petal hole spray. The 2006 results showed no injury, no difference in injury when you have the trap tree plots versus the perimeter row sprays. And when you compare the amount of, amount of insecticide use in these two approaches, trap tree only spray versus perimeter row only spray, 
the petal hole. There was a 70% reduction of uh, insecticide use. But when you compare the trap tree approach for control versus the conventional three full block sprays of insecticide, the reduction is about 93%. So the idea was, can you then bait the trap tree with the Salaharan pheromone, multiple trees in the block, you spray a petal fall, then you only spray those trees, let's say every 10 days, two or three times. Long curculios, they will aggregate, and you can kill them with insecticide. Then some of this fruit is infested with the larvae of long curculio. Can you then, after the fruit drops to the ground, there is some larvae. So the density of larvae in the soil is going to be greater than the density anywhere else in the orchard. Can you target those areas and apply entomopathogenic nematodes? Those are insect killing nematodes that have proven to be effective at killing plum curculio. There are different species. They can kill different um, pest species also. So last year we published a paper um, with multiple um, collaborators from New England and also in West Virginia, Dr. Tracy Lesky. Here is the abstract. And what, what I would like to highlight is that number one, we tested for six years in seven orchards. That is a lot of um, in data sets that we analyzed where we're testing the trap tree approach multiple years, but at the same time, we're testing the nematodes multiple years. So, and this work has been done with growers. Here is the table that shows every grower cooperator every time that we tested this uh, um, approach. Not everyone cooperated every every year, and you must only when I came back. That's when it could be it was done. Just as an example, just as an example, I will just pick Apple Hill Farm, Concord, New Hampshire, where you have these two blocks. One is nine acres, or it was nine acres. The other plot in red is 3.7 acres. So these two, block, these two blocks received a petal fall spray. But in bloom, when the trees were in bloom, you can see all these yellow dots. Those are the trap trees that were baited with Benzalacaran pheromone. So there were 20 trap trees. After the petal fall spray, only those trees were sprayed. In the other control, in the other block, in the red block, after the petal fall spray, only the perimeter was sprayed. So just to make this long story short, is that across all these seven orchards, across these six years, this is what we found. When you sample fruit from the trap trees in the perimeter, only the trap trees, yes, you have more injury. That is expected because you are congregating plum curculios to those trees. So then you can see now in the grower standards, the perimeter row sprays after petal fall spray 1.4. That tells you that the congregation of plum curculios is not random. So when you have a trap tree that has no lure, just for comparison, of course you have 10 times more injury in the trap, trap tree. But that's what that's what I want. That's what you hope you would want. Then what you see in the, peri in the perimeter, 2.6% injury in the trap tree plots versus 1.3% injury on the grower standard. Well, that shows that the perimeter, excluding the trap trees, there seems to be some level of injury, but 2.6% is also what you can expect just by having the grower standard. So it happens that it was 2.6 and 1.3, but you can decide if that was uh, acceptable or not. But in the interior, there was no difference. So even though we didn't spray the interior of the blocks, but same with the grower standard, injury was similar. And regarding the entomopathogenic nematodes, that information is in that paper that I show you in, in work, working with growers, but independent work was done with the students at UMass. And the question is, okay, but why do you want to kill larvae in the soil? I mean, are you going to buy nematodes and apply to the soil in some locations, maybe hot spots? 
In my opinion, yes, because you can reduce populations for the next year. But also, when you have a high, when you have high pressure of plum curculios, let's say high infestation, those plum curculios that emerge in the summer, they are going to be feeding on, on the apples. So they're going to be causing this type of damage, damage that you see in the picture. So if you can apply nematodes in the, in the, to the soil and you can kill, I would say 80% 80, 80 of plum curculios present in the soil, number one, you have a lower population for, for this summer and winter, but you, can, you may also reduce some injury uh, by feeding on the fruits. So here is just a poster with the students that I have uh, been working for the last few years. And here is just basically that we have been also testing the commercial uh, nematodes. For the research that was published, we got the nematodes from, from USDA. We have to have high quality control over those nematodes. But when it comes on where can growers buy the nematodes, well, Arbic Organics is one place. I don't mean it's the only one. I have been buying from them. So that I can test if those ones commercials are effective or not. So we have been placing the fruits on the ground, applying the nematodes, placing the emergence cages to, to get the results. And what you can see in this graph is basically is the mean number of plum curculios emerging from these emerging cages. And I want to point to the water control. So when you apply, when you place larvae of plum curculio infested fruit, and you apply water, which of course there is no nematodes that are going to be surviving. That's what you get as emerging, and they emerge about six per cage. But when you apply this species, Rio Brave, the ratio is six to one. You can reduce by 80 or 85 percent the population in the soil emerging. So it's going to be killing nematodes and, and plum curculios. And this other species, Carp Carpocapse, seems to be very good. There is some variability, but Rio Brave is the best one. This Felti that we tested, it doesn't do anything because it's as bad as, or it, it, they survive. It's not effective at killing. That's what we found. While we're waiting, Jaime, um, a couple questions. Yes, sir. So on the plum peculio, I've never seen them sting fruit until they get to about I'd say at least six millimeters, usually about eight millimeters diameter. So do you agree that you can hold off on a plum curculio pedophile spray until the fruit start to size up? Um, that's a, I mean, that's a really good question. And it's hard to tell, I mean, the answer would be, the answer should be yes. When the fruit is six to eight millimeters, it's more susceptible. What happens that early in the season, plum curculios are going to be looking for the biggest fruit. So they're going to prefer the fruit that is the king fruit. So if you happen to have fruit that is, let's say, less than six millimeters, but is the king fruit, like early, I'm talking about early cultivars, that's highly susceptible. And when you have a combination of multiple, multiple cultivars in one block, that makes things even more difficult because I would say short answer is yes, but I would say don't delay the petal fall spray too much because I think that what has happened in different places, including UMass, one block that got 4% injury. I think it was a result of multiple cultivars where we just couldn't go at the right time because most, most of the trees were still in bloom. I mean, some cultivars. So that makes things tricky for some growers, I think. So yes, six, six to eight millimeters is true. Um, but even before, I don't know, it just don't delay the spray. That's, I guess, what I'm, what I'm trying to say. The, and then in terms of the uh, nematode control, what percentage of the plum cuculio are coming in from outside the block? You know, is, is it really worth killing plum cuculio right underneath the tree? when most of them are coming in from outside the block, so you're not really going to affect the population for next year that much, are you? Well, yes, I am talking about the plum curculios that develop in the soil after the injury was done. So I, I have been discussing with Liz doing a project with the students 
because I think the adults can also be targeted with nematodes, but it's very hard to, well, that's what you're saying, it's hard to guess where they are in the in the forest. I mean, I'm not going to be spraying nematodes everywhere, but I'm talking about the, the larvae in the soil after they lay the eggs. Yeah, that'll knock down the population for later in the summer, but it's not going to help you for next year, correct? It may help over time. I mean, I cannot pre predict, but it, it can, multiple years of doing these um, applications may be able to reduce over time, but I am not able to, to tell you that. It's just, um, I, I, see the, I see your point, Glenn. Yeah, I see your point. Well, I see your point too, though. I guess if you kill them, they won't be able to head out to the woods to overwinter if you, if you kill them in the orchard, so. Yeah, if you have 100 adults laying eggs in trap trees and you have 1,000 larvae in the soil, I mean, I'm just guessing, and you kill 85%, uh, so you are left with 150 only, as opposed to 1,000. That's to me a, an indication that you will have possibly a lower population next year. <laughs> It's hard to guess. I mean, it's hard to really tell you, but if you don't do it, you will have these 1,000 adults developing into larvae, into, into, I mean, larvae developing into adults. So I guess it's like a, what we're trying to do also is to find a different source of um, mortality. So we're finding, and this is just, we haven't tested this, we're finding that in one block in Belcher Town, that has been used for nematode work for many years. We're finding that in some areas in the soil, when you place larvae, there is something there in the soil that is killing them. So I think it's also a fungus, or it could it could be nematodes that are now able to reproduce, which is, I don't want to say that they can do it because they are not supposed to overwinter in, in the Northeast, some species. But in Cornell, there is a researcher who, who is developing this so identify, identifying strains that are more uh, persistent, that can survive in the winter. And maybe the, maybe you can have the same nematodes uh, being able to control without reapplying. I don't know that. Right. Well, certainly interesting to see what could develop there. I got a couple questions in the chat. I'll save one for after you're done. But um, one right now is, on the tarnished plant bug parasitoid wasp, is that something people can purchase? And would it be, if so, would it be worth releasing them in their orchard? Well, you know what? I don't know if you can buy the, the parasitic wasp. I am guessing that you cannot, but I can spend time checking a couple of places today. And if I find that you can buy the, the parasitic wasp, it will be an, an World, worldwide effort to do it. I mean, to to release it. I don't think it's available, but I will make sure that it's correct. So you think, I guess I question if it would be worth releasing them in your orchard because you don't know where they're going to go. I mean, it's not like you're going to get control that year from releasing. Yeah. You got to get them established and everything anyway. Yeah, it's a tricky situation because you may have even you may have even spread against that is plant bug and you may, you may still get some injury I mean, low but some it's not going to be perfect control of a uh, tarnished plant bug chemical control is only partially effective that's what it shows based on many years of research that may not unless you have really high populations it may not be worth to spray insecticide um, in my opinion i only have a couple of slides left actually just one more because as part of control, of course, we have to talk about insecticides. And when you go to the New England Tree Fruit and Management Guide, you will find that there is some options, some materials that you can apply before bloom if you are trying to control damage plant bug. But those materials are mostly parithroids. There is one uh, new nicotinoid, which is just not so effective according to the guide. So I'm not going to be discussing those options because parithroids can also cause some problems with the mites. So what I would like to do is just discuss this table, which is the materials that you can apply. It's like a summary of the New England guide. It tells you the 
trade name on the left, the active ingredient, the IRAC uh, um, code. So IRAC is Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. It's about uh, resistance management. You can see the different groups. For example, four, it tells you that it's a new nicotinoid. Um, so you can see in the column of TPV, Tarnish Plant Bog, well, according to the guide, the material that you can apply is a bond uh, at petal pole when you target only that insect. But my point will be, well, I think you would want to use a material against plum curculio. That will be the target species for petal fall. And that will take care of other insects such as tarnish plant bog and European apple supply. So for plum curculio, then you have materials with, which are highly uh, effective um, at controlling plum curculio at petal fall. So the H, that's what it means. That those are highly effective materials. There is a question mark in, the in a new material that is uh, verde, verde print. Um, it belongs to a different group, um, 28, which is similar to Alta Core. They are in the same category. So you can see the question mark because we didn't know how effective was verde print against plum curculio. But based on reports from other entomologists and also based on some work that we did in Belchard Town last year, we compared verde print versus Avant, and there was no difference. So basically, I will suggest that, uh, or I will say that against Plum Curculio, verde print seems to be also a good material. So um, one of them, which is Actara, it depends on what you spray, of course, is a big hazard. So this table is a summary for petal fall on the most effective materials. Um, and I will just say focus on plum curculio. That will be the target best thing. I just want to end and we can spend time with questions because I have presented this before. So I guess half of you have seen this, but what I have been doing, what I have tried to do for research at UMass is to focus on attract and kill systems. And those could be in the form of bait, bait stations. You can see some pictures that includes Apple Mago Fly, mass trapping systems, I have done the work before with uh, Japanese beetles, uh, bait sprays against fruit flies, um, and also trap trees and trap crops. And I just want to highlight that to be able to develop these uh, systems, you have to have very powerful attractants. So for plum curculio, the trap trees, or even monitoring with traps is working because we have this pheromone plus the, the benzaldehyde. So you have to have a powerful attractants and then sometimes you can include the visual cues. You can see some traps are yellow, some traps are um, red, the apple maggot. So you can integrate visual cues with um, olfactory responses and you can bring the pest to some locations where you can kill them. So that's, that's pretty much the focus of the research. Plus, I am al also working with the biological control and um, other aspects of IPM. So the next slide is just to provide you with an overview of in one minute of what is happening in UMass. Because for example, to them, I'm talking about early season pests, but we have been working for two years on apple maggot fly. So we found that you can use the apple maggot lures. You can deploy those lures in the perimeter. And then you only spray the perimeter with insecticide and sugar. Sugar is a power stimulant. So we're finding that you can get a um, good control of apple maggot only applying insecticide in the perimeter, but you have to have sugar as a power stimulant. So just 10 seconds there. Then we're also working with the spotting with Drosophila. We are trying to work with the small scale growers as a way of um, mo improving monitoring and maybe trapping out in the fly. We found that diluted Concord grape juice is very attractive to spotted winter drosophila. It's very cheap and it could be used as a monitoring uh, uh, tool or that's, I need to do more work in, this, in that area, maybe to trap uh, more uh, trap females. It's very attractive to females. Next insect. So we just, I just got noticed that we have a new grant that has been approved for funding. So we're going to be spending two years working on the brown marmorated, combining trap cropping 
we're going to be using dwarf sunflower and buckwheat in combination with the pheromone to attract these pests to specific locations where you can kill them. So I will not say more now because I want to spend much time, but with plum curculio, I just presented the, this approach where we are using the trap trees for control. They're all orbited trees. You spray insecticides, you kill adults, you apply nematodes to the soil and you kill the larvae. But we are continuing to improve the trap tree. Uh, we are trying to develop, uh, we are trying to improve the lure to reduce the number of lures that you need because the lures are not cheap, they're expensive. And then I also have another grad student working on tortricid moths. So the focus has been cotley moth, oriental fruit moth, oblique banded leaf rollers. And he's basically studying um, or evaluating lures or plant, plant volatiles that can be used, hopefully, to kill females. So that way you can improve monitoring of females. And I don't think, I, I cannot tell you, but I hope you can kill some of those uh, female insects that are coming to the orchard to lay the eggs. So one question earlier on was, is there enough data to detect any changes in the activity of the insects highly linked to bloom stage due to climate change and shifting temperature regimes? Oh, this, this is good. Um, I am not aware. Um, I think the most concerning situation will be where insects can respond very quickly to changes in temperature uh, within a season. But my main concern is when you have this situation that doesn't include insects, where you have maybe trees in early spring in bloom and there is a frost, that's more concerning to me than the insects at this moment. But I don't, I am not aware of any changes that anyone has recorded uh, differences in activity because of climate change. Um, here's a question. Do some of your lures attract wild bees? Is that a good idea? Are you going to hurt the bees? In the plexiglass panels that I was studying every every day, I was checking them for um, um, plum curculio. I didn't find bees. The lures are going to be useful in trap trees after petal fall. So there is not going to be any more blooms. And just the Vensalia alone is not going to attract honeybees, for example. And similar question, do the white traps attract honeybees? The white traps? Uh, it's possible, but that's a standard uh, tool. Um, I think honeybees can also be attracted to blue. They may be more attracted to other, other colors, maybe yellow. So white, maybe somebody can help me. Kathleen, I don't know if she's there. Have you seen honeybees kill in white sticky cards? I think the answer would be yes, but low numbers. That's my experience too. You catch some on the white traps, but not that many. Question, does plum curculio affect crab apple? Can you trap, can you put the traps in crab apples? Well, uh, if the crab apple penology, when you have fruit before the, the cultivar that you're trying to grow, it's a, it's a possibility. I haven't thought about that, but it, I could have a trap tree this year on crab apple, meaning the, the pollination trees. Uh, that's a good point. My honest answer would be, I don't know if you can use trap, trap apple as a trap tree. What's the difference between plum curculio and apple curculio? Apple curculio, to my knowledge, is a different species, which it has been reported more in Michigan. Uh, and to my knowledge, is an insect that until 10, five years ago, it wasn't very abundant, but they started finding this pest uh, in, I think it was organic orchards mostly, but I have not seen that species in Massachusetts. There is a person asking about organic options for plum curculio. I am going to type the name of one insecticide, which is Acera. So basically, this insecticide integrates pyganic and neem together. Plum curculio is not, I mean, it's hard to kill, <laughs> just like a distinct box. Um, on the other side, uh, on the other hand, apple maggot and spotted wind drosophila, they're easy to kill with the sprays. So what my point is that when you, you, if you are organic, the best chance to kill plum curculio, in my opinion, will be a cera, 
using a high rate. You have to, you can take the label online before you buy, but the situation with Acera is that it's expensive. Last time I bought one gallon of Acera in, before I came to Massachusetts, that was in Missouri. I was trying to use this material against uh, stink box, also against squash box, which are hard to kill. And I found that it was about $360 at that moment for one, for one gallon of Acera. But it could be Paiganic, the high rate, which is, I think is five, I think it's five, it's, it's Paiganic. There, there is two formulations. I will, I will go for the five or Acera. But if you give me the choice of Paiganic or Acera, I will go for Acera. But Paiganic, I think they sell smaller amounts like a Papa Port and Port, but Acera, until a few years ago, you could only buy one gallon and it was expensive. Do you think Piganic, does Azera work? I mean, is Piganic gonna give you enough residual to have any effect on plum curculio? Well, when we talk about plum, uh, uh, when we talk about organic materials, that's the best that I can come up with, but I will use it maybe in combination with a uh, cowling clay. So you can apply, for example, one idea will be um, surrounds, early in the season, it's going to push insects away, but with rainfall, it's going to wash off. So they're coming back. So you, maybe you can combine the push, which is around with the pull, like a push pull, maybe using the lure, which I cannot. So that's just a, one way I will do it if I, was, if I was an organic grower. Maybe one or two trees with the pheromone and benzaldehyde for plant curculio, maybe killing the insect in those trees using acera. You have to apply acera three times a week because you're, I, I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you, Glenn. Those are botanical insecticides. Those degrade very quickly with UV light and heat. So you have to spray three times a week at least. But at least you're maybe going to spray just a few trees, maybe the trap trees. And then everywhere else, everywhere else you can have the cowling clay. Push pull. I'm not sure organic allows you to use the benzaldehyde lure though, does it? I'm not, I don't know, but. Um... Well, yes, you can, if you are a certified organic, you need to talk to your uh, certifier because as long as the volatile is not in contact with the crop, it, it may not be the same with every certifier. But for example, with Japanese beetles in Missouri, I was using the lures in the orchard, in an organic um, blueberry orchard, university orchard, but it was, it was certified organic because the certifier allowed the use of plant volatiles and pheromones. So I just wanna give a brief intro to the Ag Radar, Radar, Ag Radar Weather Service um, that we've been working on for a couple of years. Basically this replaces Skybit, but it more than replaces it. It's actually better than Skybit. So what we're doing is pulling weather data from the NOAA weather grids. And that's where, you know, the forecast you hear on the radio or see on TV, that's the same databases those TV meteorologists and radio bulletins come from. So um, we have hourly data and it's, again, it's site specific um, down to one and a half miles. So we have two, um, it says 1.8 mile there, but it's actually one and a half miles now. And let me go to the next slide. So these are the sites we have in Maine. Um, just because I put colors on the different sites, it really doesn't matter. They're all getting the same weather. Um, that was for my consumption about doing some ag radar stuff for decision support models on top of it. So the red sites are sites where I hope to be doing ag radar for um, apple growers. And here's just a list of the, some of the towns that for which we have sites set up. We're adding a couple more here. So there's a big hole there around Augusta. So we're gonna put a, an Augusta site in and there might be some more sites being added in later. Most, we have 79 sites in Maine and they're running right now. And in fact, let me just show you, you can go to the web right now and see charts like this 
for those sites. So there's the map of what we've got. Um, just to show you the kind of stuff that we're pulling down. The, by the way, this comes as an email report also. If you sign up for an email report, you would get email messages twice a day with the weather data. They won't look exactly like this. They're a little simpler and they're not as, they don't have the color and all that. So these tables will be posted online and you could go online and see the more, um, more complete tables or you can just read your email and get the black and white, a little bit reduced table, not quite as many things. Um, but it would have the same range with the 48 hours every three hours with air temperature. Um, apparent temperature is like, it includes the wind chill and the heat stress. So it's, it's the temperature interpreted, you know, in terms of those other effects on humidity and wind. If you're between 50 degrees and 80 degrees, the apparent temperature is exactly the same as the air temperature. So you got dew point, um, wet bulb, those are good for frost prediction. Um, of course, you got precip in there and the chance of precip and the type of precip and wind speed, wind gust. Uh, we've got solar radiation, that's good for um, uh, irrigation planning and all that. Here's the 10 day daily forecast. A lot of the same things, just reduced to the daily level of max and min, um, total daily precipitation. And that's where the evapotranspiration shows up, that orange line there. And that shows you how much water plants are pulling out of the ground. So it's based on temperature and sunlight and wind. And uh, we're going to have, we don't have this quite running yet, but we're going to have a spraying index and a drying index. The drying index will be for forage, um, for cut hay, but I've also got some drying indexes for other things that we'll be showing within Ag Radar tools, not the Ag Radar weather report. I know that's a little confusing, but what, what most people think, most apple growers in Maine anyway, think of Ag Radar was the decision support tools, um, you know, the pest forecast and timing for different uh, emergence and apple scab infection periods and all that stuff. That's being called Ag Radar Tools. The, the weather itself, just the weather, we're calling Ag Radar Weather. Okay. Um, so, and same thing for observations, um, you know, going back seven days. So the forecast goes out um, 10 days at the present. We are going to extend that to 16 days coming up. Um, and this is the kind of chart you can see online. Um, you know, it's typical what you get for weather reports. It's got icons for whether it's sunny or cloudy and the wind direction and the wind speeds and the temperatures, you know, the max and min temperatures. And there's charts like, and these are running by the way for those 79 sites already. I'm not sure we're making those public yet though. So when they do become public, um, I will send the link out in the main tree fruit newsletter. But for each site, um, and if you hover your mouse, I can't do it, this is a fixed slide here, but on the live slides, if you hover your mouse over a, a marker, it shows you what the exact values are for that hour. And so this is temperature, and then this is dew point temperature, the dashed line. Down here, this is cloud cover, and this is precipitation, accumulated precip, and this is hourly precip. We're gonna change the scale on those so that the hourly precip's a little easier to read. And then down here, you've got wind speed and gust, wind gust. And so those charts are gonna be online um, pretty soon here. This is actually an outdated slide. This was our coverage area originally. Now we're doing the internal, the entire continental US. Main growers probably don't care about that, but anybody who's watching this webinar from another state, we can do sites from outside of Maine. However, we're not doing those for free. There is a subscription charge, which is cheaper than what Skybit was charging, but we do have to charge. But Maine sites are going to be free this year. And I'm going to, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to end with this one. This is how the whole gridded thing works. And this is, again, this is how National Weather Service takes all that data from satellites and ground stations. 95 to 90% of their data these days come from satellites. And it all gets put into the computers and gridded. And they basically create a simulated Earth. And they, they figure out 
you know, what the temperature is on each point. Again, we're doing that at 1.5 mile resolution, um, 2.5 kilometer resolution for the forecast and the observations. The longer range forecast um, is a little bit uh, less spatial resolution. It goes down to about 18 miles. That's when you get beyond three days. But beyond three days, your forecast specificity is such that you really don't have 1.5 mile specificity anyway. So that's what's up with that. And I guess I'll end there because it's 131.